Hello, my name is Rabbi Pesach Krohn, and I am so proud to be able to present to all of you another edition of Living Lessons. It's produced by my dear son in law, Rabbi Hanania Kramer of Baltimore, Kolram Multimedia. Every one of us is supposed to have three loves Avas Hashem, we love Hashem, Avas Atayra, loving the Torah, and Avas Israel, loving each other, loving every yid. How do we know about Avas Yisrael? So the Pasek tells us, You should love your neighbor, your Yiddish neighbor like yourself. And you know something? Rashi brings what Rabbi Akiva says, This is such an important rule in the Torah. And I saw that the Ksav Seifa explained something so beautiful. Why is this so important? Do you know why? Because there are certain mitzvahs that perhaps not everyone can do. For example, if you're not a Kayin, you can't do certain other mitzvahs. But if you love the Kayin and you give him encouragement to be what he can be, then you have a chalik in that mitzvah. There are many mitzvahs for people who live in Eretz Yisrael. We who live outside Eretz Yisrael, we can't do those mitzvahs. But if we love the Yidden in Eretz Yisrael, and we amachazik them, and we encourage them, then they can fulfill their tafkid, their role of filling all the mitzvahs. And you know something? Loving every Yid is so important. Adults to children, children to adults, and of course, Rebbe's to Talmidim. And in these five stories that you are going to see, you are going to see so many wonderful ideas about one person who just, it pained him so much that people were getting into an argument and he did something and eventually it saved his child's life. We are gonna see something about a great Rosh Hashiva who does something so special for a Talmud and the Talmud was so surprised that the Rebbe even did it for him. We're going to learn about a neighbor who was so kind to two little children who really did something that was not so nice. And I must tell you, those two little children were my grandchildren, but they didn't mean anything bad. And this man was so wonderful to them. And then there's a story about a soldier, a from soldier who was out in Seattle and how he was befriended there, way far away from home. And finally, we're gonna learn about two boys in the yeshiva who were so concerned for each other that the principal was so inspired by their Avas Yisrael. So enjoy these stories. Let's learn the lessons of Avas Yisrael. And each of one, each of us in our own way, will have Avas Atayra, Avas Hashem, and Avas Yisrael. The name of this story is to blossom and to grow. In Baltimore today, there is a doctor, his name is Dr. Josh Hurwitz, and he loves to do gardening. He loves to do landscaping. You see, in the year 2002, Rabbi and Mrs. Hanania Kramer, who had been in the Kolel in Ne Yisrael, moved just six houses away from Dr. Hurwitz. Well, it was getting close to Shavuos, and we all know that there is a minig in Klal Yisrael that in the homes and in the shuls throughout Klal Yisrael, they always decorate it with flowers and greenery because that's exactly how Har Sinai looked when Klal Yisrael got the Torah. And so right before Yontif, Rabbi Kramer bought his wife a beautiful bouquet of flowers and she took the flowers and she put it on the Yontif table and the house looked very pretty with flowers. Well, right before Yontif, the two children of Rabbi and Mrs. Kramer, Yaakov, who was seven and a half, and Adina, who was six, they came into the home and they were holding very beautiful flowers. And Mrs. Kramer, she figured out in a second where these kids got the flowers and she said, Yaakov and Adina, where did you get those flowers? Well, they were a little bit embarrassed and they said, well, we went to Dr. Hurwitz's garden and we figured he's got so many beautiful flowers that he probably wouldn't miss these. And we took the flowers and we'd wanted to bring it to you as a gift for Shavuos. 
And Mrs. Kramer said, well, that's so nice of you, but you did something that is not correct. It's not right. You cannot go to somebody's garden, especially Dr. Hurwitz, who takes such pride in the flowers, and take his flowers without permission? Oh, you have to go back, and you have to ask him for forgiveness. You have to tell him you're sorry, and you've got to bring back those flowers. And so they all walked down six houses to Dr. Hurwitz and knocked on the door. And Yaakov and Adina said, we apologize, we're sorry. We took the flowers without permission. We wanted to give them to our mother for Shavuos. We're sorry. And Dr. Hurwitz was a very nice man, smiled. And he said to Mrs. Kramer, children will be children. It's okay. After Yontif, I'll take care of it. I'll put back everything that they may have taken and everything will be fine. Well, two days after Yontif, Mrs. Kramer was very surprised when Dr. Hurwitz knocked on her front door and he said, can I see your children? Oh, Mrs. Kramer was afraid that maybe now Dr. Hurwitz was really going to give it to them and he would be angry. But she called Yaakov and Adina. She said, Dr. Horowitz is here to see you. And he took them to the backyard and he took some bulbs and some seeds and he put it into the children's hands. And he said, here, Kindalach, here, let's plant it together. We'll see how Hashem's flowers grow. And he told them, I'm going to show you how to water these flowers and these seeds and you will see then a few weeks they're gonna blossom and then we'll be able to see some beautiful flowers. And when the flowers finally grew, Dr. Hurwitz came back and he showed them the beauty of what flowers really are like, what beautiful flowers can be when they're taken care of. And then more than anything else, then they really realized how wrong they were by taking those things from Dr. Hurwitz. But what a wonderful teacher he was. Instead of getting angry, he made sure that the children grew and the flowers blossomed. And that's what Avas Yisrael is. When you don't get angry at somebody who may have done something wrong, after all, they were children. But he showed them the beauty of nature and the beauty of friendship. The name of this story is damage control. This story happened just last year in Yerushalayim on a street named Rehov Uziel. You see, there was an Epstein family. They lived in an apartment building. Hello. But they lived on the first floor level. Now, living on the first floor can be wonderful. Oh, yeah. You don't have to climb the steps every time you go into your home. Now, unscrupulous people (laughs) broke into a window and they robbed things from the home. Somebody stole my stuff. The Epsteins were very frightened and very upset. And they decided that they are going to make a very strong fence yeah, look at that around fence. their mirpeset, around their balcony, so that Yay. nobody would be able to steal anything off their porch or even Chas Shalom get into their home. No one's getting in here. The neighbors who lived directly upstairs from the Epsteins, the Carlins, yep, the Carlins, they became very upset. And they said to the Epsteins, look, if you make a fence around your porch, around your merpeset, well, burglars could climb on top of that fence and they could come into our balcony, which is right on top of yours, and they would steal from us. Well, unfortunately, an argument started between the Epsteins and the Carlins. And even though in this apartment building, there had been shalom until then, there had been peace, now everybody took sides. Some said the Epsteins were right, some said the Carlins were right, and it began getting nasty. Now, on the third floor, it was a wonderful person. His name was Akiva Bodner, and he called a meeting. He called Mr. Epstein and Mr. Carlin, and he said, I would like to have a meeting with both of you. Can you come to my home? Okay, fine. Okay, fine. They both agreed to come, and he said to them, Look, Chazal teach us that there is nothing more important than peace. As a matter of fact, Chazal teach 
that the Kali, the vessel that holds the greatest blessing, is the vessel of peace. And he told them something fascinating. He said, vessel or Kali in Hebrew is spelled Kof Lamed Yud. Kof is the first letter of the word Kohen. Lamed is the first letter of the word Levi. And Yud is the first letter of the word Yisrael, which shows us that all Jews, and we are either a Kohen, a Levi, or Yisrael, we all have to get along. And he said, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I can afford it. I am going to pay for a fence to be made around the Carlin's balcony and porch on the second floor. And like this, nobody will be able to climb on the first fence and to get into the apartment of the Carlin's or to the balcony of the Carlin's because they will also have a strong fence. And that's exactly what happened. So now people who walked along the street saw both fences both in the Epstein first floor apartment and in the Carlin second floor apartment. You will not believe what happened six months later. It was the fourth night of Hanukkah and they asked their 12 year old daughter if she would babysit because they just wanted to go for a little walk. And you know, a fire started in the Bodner apartment. People from outside saw smoke coming from the apartment and they ran upstairs to help, but the front door was locked and nobody could get in because the fire was right next to the door. And they climbed up the fence from the Epstein balcony to the Carlin balcony and up into the Bodner porch. They broke open the windows and they ran inside and they were able to save all the Bodner children. And look at this, only because Mr. Akiva Bodner had given money so that the fence could be built on the second floor with those fellows able to climb up on that fence and save his children. That's what Shalom is all about. That's what Avas Yisrael is all about. Because Rabbi Akiva Bodner wanted to bring Shalom, the fire of Machlekes, the fire of argument and contention was put out and the fire in his home was able to be put out and it did little serious damage. What a story of peace and what a story of Avas Yisrael. The name of this story is a Simcha from Savannah to Seattle. During World War II, a young Orthodox Jewish man, Benjamin Garfunkel from Savannah, Georgia, was a captain in the Fort Lewis Air Force Base in Seattle, Washington. Now, Benjamin knew that it was just a matter of time until he would have to go overseas. But Shavuos was coming, and he did not want to be overseas over Yontif. And so he asked for permission that he should get a furlough, which means that he should be able to have some time off for the Jewish holiday of Shavuos. And this furlough was granted to him. So he went to Seattle, and he came to a wonderful family that was known for their Hachnosas Orchim, the Ganauers. He stayed with them for Shavuos, and he stayed up with the men a whole night, learning Taira and saying to them together. The next morning, everyone in Seattle knew that you go to the house of a man by the name of Tuvia Rendler, and it was a big kiddish waiting for everyone who had stayed up, and it was very, very lively. Well, when Tuvia saw the young man standing in the back, a shy young soldier, he announced, he said, come up here, young man, we're so proud to have you here. And of course, Benjamin Garfunkel was brought up front and he sat pretty close to where Tuvia was. And then Tuvia said to the young man, where do you come from? Now, with great respect, Benjamin Garfunkel said, sir, I come from Savannah, Georgia. All of a sudden, Tuvia got very serious. And he said, Savannah, Georgia, wow. Let me tell you a story that happened to me when I was in Savannah. He said, you know, when I was 15 years old, I came from Poland. My uncle brought me across the Atlantic Ocean to New York, but I just couldn't make a living there. So we had to decide where I would move so I could earn a living. And we decided that I should go down to Savannah, Georgia. But my uncles warned me He said, just remember, they don't like Jews down south, so be very careful. Don't let people know that you're a Jewish fellow, because you'll never be able to sell anything. 
Well, two of you got off the boat in Savannah, found a place where he could stay, and sure enough, he began selling pots and pans. Now, the truth is that he really needed a license and he didn't have one. And Tuvia said, you know, I was selling for only about 15 or 20 minutes and a policeman came over to me and he said, sir, do you have a license to sell here? Well, I really didn't have a license. And he said, come with me. And the policeman arrested him. He took me to the police station, locked me in a cell, and I had no idea what was happening to me. Tell you the truth, I was terrified. I was a young boy, I had no idea what they were gonna do with me. It seemed to me I was there for a very long time. And finally, a police officer came to me and said, the chief of the police would like to see you right now. I was so nervous, I came out of the cell and I came into this big office where the chief of police was sitting in his big padded chair. There were other officers in the office and they were all talking and laughing. But then when I came in, suddenly the chief of police got very serious and he said, everyone should leave the office except the young boy. Now it was me and him and it was very quiet. And the chief of police said to me, come here, young man. I came to the desk. He stuck out his hand and he said to me, Shalom Aleichem. I was shocked. How did this Gentile chief of police know how Jews greet each other? Did he know that I was Jewish? Because I wore a cap? He certainly couldn't see the yarmulke or my tzitzis. Maybe I just had a Jewish face. I was terrified. And then the chief of police said to me, don't be afraid. Ich bin Ayid. I am a Jew. And he gave me a big smile. And then he said to me, I want you to know they hate us down here south. But in the office, I run the show. Nobody tells me what to do. He said to me, young man, you need a license to sell here, but don't worry, I'm going to get it for you. And within hours, the chief of police came back and sure enough, he had a license and I was able to sell. And two of you said, you know, from there, I was able to become very successful. And many, many times, I was in the chief of police's home for Shabbos. Eventually, I was able to build up a nice parnosa. I had a livelihood, and I moved to Seattle. And that's where I am till this very day. Suddenly, Benjamin Garfunkel stood up and said softly, Reb Tuvia, can I tell you something? My name is Benjamin Garfunkel. The chief of police was my father, Charles Garfunkel. Everybody gasped. Nobody could believe it. Tuvia smiled and he picked up another glass of whiskey and he said, L'chaim, soldier, you've got a place of honor in my house whenever you want to come. And sure enough, anytime Benjamin had off, he always made sure to come to Seattle and he was either by the Ganauers or by Tuvia Rendler. And you know something? Eventually, Benjamin went back down to Savannah. He raised a family and today his son, Rab Nussan Garfunkel is one of the most prominent people in Savannah, Georgia. And he was the one who told me this amazing story. The name of this story is Two on Hold. The story took place in a yeshiva in Yerushalayim where the children in the elementary school were able to buy raffles in order to win a number of prizes. The money was going to go for Tzedakah. Now, all the boys were very excited, and for weeks and weeks, different boys, obviously, throughout the school, bought the raffles. Finally, a big assembly was held, and all the boys were in the auditorium. And the principal was going to announce who was going to be the winners. And he announced the first winner, and that boy was going to win a set of Mishnayas. The second boy, was announced and he won the bicycle. And then the third boy was announced. His name was Moishi Landau. And Moishi Landau was sitting in the back and it was announced Moishi Landau is the winner of the 500 shekel first prize. Everybody was clapping and they were waiting for Moishi Landau to come forward. But he didn't leave his seat. 
Finally, his Rebbe came to him and said, Moishi, why don't you go up and claim your prize? And Moishi said something so interesting. He said, I didn't buy the ticket. I couldn't afford to buy a raffle ticket. And my friend, Penny Friedman, he was the one who bought the ticket for me. And he probably put my name on that ticket. So really, he's the winner, not I. Well, when the Rebbe heard that, he went over to Penny Friedman and said, Penny, did you actually buy that ticket? He said, yes, I did, and I put Moishi's name on it. So he is the winner, and not I. So it was amazing. Moishi was saying it belongs to Penny. Penny was saying it belonged to Moishi. And the Rebbe just didn't know what to do. He said, okay, we'll have to settle this matter a little later. And later he went to the principal. So the principal said, wow, this is a very interesting Shaila. I'm going to go to one of the Gedele Hadar, Rabbi Yitzchok Zilberstein, and I'm going to ask him the Shaila. Rabbi Yitzchok Zilberstein is a very, very warm, friendly person. And he greeted the principal, Rabbi Pfeiffer, when he came in very warmly. And he said, how are you? How is your school going? What can I do for you? And Rabbi Pfeiffer said, he told him the story. And Rabbi Zilberstein smiled and he said, wow, do you know that in the beginning of Bava Metziah, there's a period called Shnaya Moichzin. And the first Mishnah talks about two people who hold on to a talus. They hold on to a piece of material and each one is claiming, Kula Shali, it belongs to me. No, so each mine. one is arguing that the whole thing belongs to me. And over here we have an argument that each one is arguing that it belongs to the other one. He said, come back tomorrow, I want to think about it. The next day, Rabbi Pfeiffer came in to speak to Rabbi Zilberstein. And Rabbi Zilberstein, with his great classic smile, said, let me tell you what I think. I think that really, Penny, the one who bought the ticket, he is the winner. Because he never really gave the money to Moishi. And being that he bought the ticket with his money, he's entitled to it. So go back and tell him that he is the winner. Well, the principal was just so happy to have the solution, but he decided to call both boys into his office. And he said to the boys, Moishi and Penny, I would like to tell you that I went to Rabbi Yitzchok Zilberstein, one of the G'dayli Hadar, and he poskined who the winner is. But before I tell you who the real winner is, I would like to say something. I am so impressed with the Avas Yisrael that you each have for each other. Penny, that you went and bought a ticket for Moishi, and Moishi, that you refused to take it because you knew that Penny only bought it out of the goodness of his heart, and you didn't want to take anything that's not really yours. I love this kind of friendship. Can I ask you boys a favor? Can I join your friendship? I would like to be part of this Avas Yisrael, and I am giving 500 shekel to Moishi because he is such an Erlicha boy and such a wonderful boy and I would like to be part of this group. So both Penny and Moishi walked out with 500 shekel from the principal's office and both the Rebbe and the principal saw that's what Avas Yisrael is all about. And that's what we have to learn. Avas Yisrael means thinking more about the other person than you think about yourself. I like to call this story Plain Chesed. Many years ago, the Rosh Hashiva of Tells, Rav Mordechai Gifter, was traveling from New York's LaGuardia Airport together with his wife, the Rebetzin. They were traveling to Cleveland, Ohio, where the Tells Yeshiva was located. It was the last flight out of New York and as the Rosh Hashiva was getting on the flight, he noticed that there was a bocher from the Beis Medrash that was trying to get on the flight. He didn't have a reservation. He was just trying to get on standby. Standby means that he doesn't have an advanced purchase ticket, but he is able to get on the flight if there is an extra seat that's available and he would be able to get on at the last minute. And sure enough, there was a seat available. Now, a number of years ago, when Rab Gifta was still alive, they still served 
kosher meals on domestic flights. Domestic flights are flights that are taking place from one area in the United States to the other. Today, you only get meals on international flights. But during that flight from New York to Cleveland, the stewardess came over to the young boy and to the bacher and said to him, you know, here is your kosher meal. Now, the boy was a very honest boy, and he said, ma'am, I'm sorry, there's no way that this could be my meal. I did not even have a reservation for this flight, and I certainly didn't order the kosher meal. So the steward said to him, young man, you are so right. It's really not your meal, but the rabbi said that we should give you the meal. Is his meal. Well, he said, I cannot eat the rabbi's kosher meal. And he went over to Rab Gifter and he said, Rosh Yeshiva, thank you so much, but there's just no way that I could take your kosher meal. And Rab Gifter said to him, younger man, young man, I want to teach you a lesson. You see, I am traveling tonight with my rabbits and with my wife. No matter how late we get back to Cleveland, I'm going to get supper. But by the time you get to the dormitory, it'll be so late, the kitchen will have been closed long ago and you're going to go without supper. I just wanted to make sure that you have supper. That's why I gave you the meal. And the boy said afterwards, he realized that a godol betoira is also a godol bechesed. A great person in teira is also a great person in chesed. The Rosh Hashiva was concerned with his love for the Talmud, that he should make sure that he would have a meal and he wouldn't go to sleep hungry. Absolutely incredible.